Hi, everybody. You are at Jim Bean Live. This is a um, somewhat monthly free webinar series that highlights recent publications published in the Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education, which is an open access um, education research journal published by the American Society for Microbiology. Um, I will be your host for today. I am Rachel Horak. I'm at the ASM Education Department. And uh, your tech operator today will be Justin. So if you have any tech support questions, put them in the chat and you can address them straight to Justin and he will help you out. Okay. So I'm super excited to introduce our speakers today. Um, they're going to talk to you about their pub paper that was recently published um, in the Jim B special issue, Teaching in a Time of Crisis. And so into the chat, um, when I turn it over, I'm gonna put in uh, links that you can read all the papers in the special issue that was published earlier this year in March and April. And I'll also put a link to their paper that you can read if you haven't already. So with uh, the, feed, the, the format of today's event, um, they're going to give um, an overview of their presentation, la presentation lasting about 25 to 30 minutes, and there'll be interaction time too. And if you have questions for our speakers today, just put them in the question and answer box. And you can also ask anonymously so that you, if you um, aren't quite sure of your question, you could also send it to me um, through the chat box and I'll ask it on your behalf. So about 25 to 30 minutes of presentation and then lots and lots of time for questions. So before we get started, just a quick um, poll. Could everybody please take this very quick demographic survey question three very quick multiple choice questions. Let's take one minute to do this before we get started. And with that, I'm turning it over to our speakers. Thanks for joining us today. Hi everyone. Thank you for joining Jenya and I today. We are very excited to discuss some of the approaches we have developed for um, active learning in our remote biology and environmental science courses during the COVID-19 pandemic. This work was done in collaboration with Kevin Bonney, the transition to remote learning would not have been possible without the tireless support of Timothy Schaefer, Lucy Apert, and the entire NYU educational technology team. In addition, we would like to thank the NYU liberal studies faculty for creating a space for open discussion and feedback. And finally, we really want to acknowledge all of our students over the last 20 months of teaching. None of the work we are gonna talk about today would have been achieved without their continued enthusiasm and dedication in the face of such unprecedented disruption in the last couple of years. The pandemic led to an abrupt transition from in-person to remote learning. It was difficult to maintain timely and effective communication, provide equitable access to course materials and encourage class participation. Despite these challenges, we found that aspects of remote learning actually enabled us to expand learning opportunities for students beyond the walls of the physical classroom. Today, we are going to present three remote active learning exercises we have developed to address the challenges posed by distance learning. First, I will introduce an asynchronous experiential lab activity I call backyard biodiversity which encourages students to leave their computers behind and gain hands-on experience despite being remote. Then we will demonstrate how Kevin Bonney has utilized synchronous polling and discussions to engage students in a lab activity about Mendelian genetics. Finally, Jenya will discuss how she uses asynchronous and synchronous approaches to lead collaborative research projects on environmental health. As we do this, sorry, <coughs> As we do this, we have a few planned activities along the way to demonstrate some of our active learning approaches, and we encourage all of you to participate. To introduce you to backyard biodiversity, we're actually going to do a quick activity just to get us started um, and to have give you an idea of how of our diversity in our own backyards from those of you in attendance today. So I'm going to put a link into the chat right now. And it shouldn't matter if you have a Google account or not. Um, if you click on the link, you'll see a page that should look very much like this um, that I'm sharing on my screen. And if you click the blue join button, you can then drag or drop a photo of, let's say, plants, animals, fungi, or other organisms that you've come across in the last two weeks 
I know mo most of us, if you are a biologist, probably take pictures as you walk around. Um, I've added some right here from just um, walking around New York City in the last week. And let's get a sense of just what we've been seeing outside. Um, so I do this with my students at the beginning of the year. Um, and it, it gets better as we go along as they actually learn how to collect pictures and look at things that are not um, just buildings in New York City. So I'm going to give everyone a second to do it. I know that um, I, I use AirDrop on my phone, but not everyone has that ability. Um, but as you do that, I'm going to keep going. Um, we can also, I can also look and see if things are coming in. So Jenya and I have put these pictures in, but um, please feel free to put a picture in and we will revisit it in a second. Um, and in the chat, if you have any issues, uh, let me know and I will troubleshoot them as I look around. <laughs> One of the nice things about remote teaching is that I now have 15 screens that happen at the same time. So in my backyard biodiversity activity, the students are asked to compare the local plant diversity found in their current neighborhood to the plant species found by another student living in a different location. I designed the lab with four major objectives in mind. First, I wanted students to have the opportunity to step away from their computers and actually get outside and observe non-virtual biology. Second, the lab is a chance for students to make their own observations and collect these as data for future analyses. Third, once back inside, students will then need to apply what they have learned about trait diversification, adaptation, evolution, and taxonomy to explain similarities and differences between the plant diversity observed in different places. Finally, each student works with a partner to clearly summarize and present the results from their surveys. Most importantly, I wanted this all to be able to be achieved um, without needing to purchase any additional supplies other than what the students had to be online. In the first part of the lab, students are asked to take a 20 to 30 minute walk around their current neighborhood. During this walk, they are tasked with identifying and recording 20 unique plant species they observe. This is made possible by, a, by Seek, which is a free smartphone application that uses machine learning approaches to help identify species based on pictures. You can actually either hold your phone camera up to a plant or an animal and it will real time ID it if it has a good enough view, or you can take pictures on your phone of the plants that you come across. And then later when you're back on Wi-Fi you can bring these pictures in to Seek and Seek will identify the pictures for you. The first time I did this exercise in the spring of 2020, the app allowed all 60 of my students who had absolutely no prior knowledge of plants to identify a total of 1,200 species. So if you're interested in trying this yourself, here's the link to the app. It works on iPhones and Androids. Um, it seems to work in almost any country in the world. The only place that I've yet to find it work was in Cuba, and that's because the app store is so limited in Cuba. But I have an entire class that is based out of Shanghai this semester, and they've all been able to use Seek in Shanghai. So each student, um, after they've done their nature walk, um, is then assigned one to two partners who are living in different locations, and then as a group, they're asked to make several comparisons between their two neighborhoods. Throughout the rest of the presentation, you're going to see slides that contain examples of two student groups work from one of my classes in the spring of 2020. Students first had to identify climate variables and the level of development in each habitat so they could use these data to explain similarities and differences they observed in their plant species. Next, the students compared the species in each of their lists to determine similarities and differences in the plants present in both locations. And I had suggested doing this as a Venn diagram, so you'll see that there's Venn diagrams all over the place here. To think further about the processes of adaptation and diversification, students were also asked to identify examples of convergent and divergent evolution among the species in their lists based on observed traits and shared taxonomy. Each group of students was asked to summarize the results in a five minute oral presentation during a Zoom class in which all the students in the class were present and provided peer review feedback. 
Most of the work on the assignment was completed independently by the students. I was available for questions to review drafts of presentations in Zoom. Class time was generally reserved for the lectures, readings, and discussions we needed to do to learn the concepts that enabled the completion of this project. So much of remote learning it tends to be about the logistics of how and when students can access course material. This lab, in contrast, takes advantage of the fact that almost anywhere nature is accessible in some form, whether you're in an urban area, a suburban area, or a rural, rural area. And the unique global setting that in many cases a remote classroom provides gives the students the chance to make connections between their specific local experience and those of other students located around the world. So I'm gonna take a peek back and see if we've had any other photos that have been added. Oh, you guys are awesome. Look at all these great photos. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, I love the lizard. So it's just fun. I So Seek seems to be a little bit better with plants than animals, but if you do have the Seek app on your phone, so I have it constantly on my phone, you can actually gamify it. You can get little badges for it. Um, so if you want to identify anything that you see in this picture, I, I know what type of fungus this is. So you can see if um, Seek can get to that fungus. Um, oh, look at that cool spider down there. Um, you can put it in the chat if you want to identify one of these species. Uh, it does work better for animals. In, um, I'm sorry, for plants. I think it's because plants don't move. So Seek is still relatively new. Um, so you'll find that sometimes it's really good at identifying and other times it, it asks you to take 15 different angles of the plant in order to figure it out. Yeah, so you might have to take a picture of the picture on the screen and then ask Seek to identify it that way. It generally helps if you have the location enabled on the app. Um, I have students using it this semester who were supposed to just look at birds in um, Washington Square Park in New York City, and I got a lot of um, what I believe are probably house sparrows identified as European and South American birds. So it does really help to have the location enabled because it allows the machine learning to sort of focus in on it better. So the second activity I'm going to introduce today was developed by our collaborator, Kevin Bonney. I'm going to demonstrate how I use this activity in my class, so it's not exactly, I think, how he applies it in his own classes, but I've been doing a lot of remote teaching still, and this is the best way I have enacted it in my remote classes. Kevin wanted to design a lab that would provide students with an opportunity to collect data during a synchronous class period without any additional supplies or travel other than being present in Zoom. This activity allows students to explore the expression of traits identified as exhibiting Mendelian patterns of inheritance in humans, such as the ones that you can see here on the slide. And we're going to do a little bit of data collecting ourselves right now. I'm going to put a link in the chat to a short poll that asks you to select which phenotype you display in the following three traits from the poll. So here is the information you need for the chat. I'm using poll everywhere. I know that you previously just answered a poll in Zoom. I've started using poll everywhere more so than um, the Zoom polling because um, I just like it's more flexible. You can actually ask different types of polls. The students can ask can answer open ended questions. You can do diagrams where you put a diagram up and the students can pin the part of the diagram that reflects the answer to a question that you ask. Um, and you can all it doesn't. We have an institutional account at NYU but um, there's also a free account available. It just limits the number of responses you can have at one time. Um, I've also done this exercise using a Google form when it's asynchronous. So um, many, there's many flexible ways to do this. So while you're finishing up the survey, I'm gonna introduce the activity. This activity is based on our observations that team-based synchronous discussions in the remote environment foster student participation and engagement. At the start of class, I put three to four students in breakout rooms. Each student is asked to answer a series of survey questions about their phenotypes, just as I've asked you to do right now. 
They can argue about whether they fit into certain categories, but they do have to show proof that they've completed a survey. So I don't see, I don't care what you've answered. I just care that you've answered the survey, but like, right, we could argue if I have a hitchhiker's thumb or if it's straight just by looking in the Zoom. So it's a nice way to like actually make them turn on their screens and look at each other. Once this is done, I can quickly pool the class data and give it out to each group. Um, and then each group is asked to complete a worksheet with questions based on the phenotype data that was collected. Then in the second half of class, we have a full class discussion about everyone's key findings and the misconceptions associated with trait inheritance. So hopefully everyone has had a second to look and fill out the survey. Let's try to look at our results right now. So we have a couple still underway, but we can look a little bit. So in this case, for tongue rolling, about 80% of us have the dominant, um, the dominant phenotype for that. And if I test that out, I also have that. Uh, face freckles, we have many people without face freckles, which is, the majority of us have no freckles, which is recessive. I actually have some freckles, so I'd have to answer the dominant one there. And for widow's peak, most people have the straight hairline. This widow's peak one is always a great debate in my classes because people are very unsure about like what constitutes a peak or a straight line. Um, and so that's always an interesting one. And so this is a really fun way to just get everyone involved, make sure the students are awake and actually showing them that they do have these traits that we believe are inherited via Mendelian patterns. And so I'm going to show you a little bit more data from 66 of my students, along with the addition of several more traits. So take a second and look at these results. And I want you in the chat, if you'd like to, so you can, you don't have to, um, write one observation that you have about the data. In class, I would have asked each group to summarize um, their findings out loud, but since this is a webinar, we can use the chat to do that. And what I like about this exercise is that the students can collect data and discuss results in real time without physically having to be in a classroom, right? All of this is stuff that they have with them, right? You can look at your Mendelian traits with you without any, you don't even need a phone to do that. And so Jenny has pointed out that sometimes the recessive phenotype is more common than the dominant one, which generally blows the students' minds. Um, that, right, like you hear the word dominant and you assume that because it's dominant, it should be the most common um, in, a, in a population. And that is not actually always the case. Um, and you can see in some cases that there are intermediate forms, which if this is Mendelian traits, right, there shouldn't be an intermediate form. It should just be discrete one or the other. And so you can see that even though these are identified as Mendelian traits, some of them may not be as Mendelian as we pretend that they are. Um, and so the students make observations about that. We also think about um, whether or not like the 66 students are, is that a diverse sample size? Should we have a bigger sample size? Um, should would this data change depending on who we polled in the survey? So it brings up a lot of interesting discussion points just by collecting a little bit of data. Like you can see that this works both with our small, smaller sample size of, size of about 20, but it also works with a larger group as well. So I'm happy to take questions at the end of the presentation. I'm now going to hand the presentation over to Jenya, who's going to discuss active learning approaches in environmental health and disease. And so Jenny, just tell me when you want me to switch okay. slides. Thanks. Hi, I'm so delighted to be here. Uh, I hope you all can hear me. If you can't, just uh, mention that in the chat. Um, my name is Jenny Naro Maciel, and uh, I'm, I'm really just pleased to be here to share some information about an exercise uh, that I designed as a result of the pandemic on environmental health and disease. Next. So many of you may have seen or felt, you know, kind of a frustration with the proliferation of misinformation around COVID-19, uh, the YouTube videos that people tended to listen to much more than uh, scientific experts. And so in this way, COVID-19 could function as a teachable moment. And one of the things that I thought it could really teach our students and our, uh, the community in general more about was environmental health. 
Um, and one of the tools that I used was the jigsaw tool in, in the active learning toolbox. And I'll talk a little bit more about that to try to put different pieces of a puzzle together to think about environmental health more holistically than we usually do. And uh, this exercise won an NYU Teaching Innovation Award, as did um, uh, Aaron's Backyard Biodiversity Exercise. And it was published in this wonderful uh, journal, Jim B. Next. So if you take a moment to just look at this diagram, it kind of shows us some ways that we can think about environmental health and some ways that our thinking can be expanded beyond the typical focus where uh, people are mostly concerned with how wildlife or pathogens affect people, <laughs> mostly themselves, right? So we tend to have a very anthropocentric view of environmental health, which means just a view that's focused on people. And so if you look at this diagram, you might recognize some examples of how diseases are thought to get to people. And if you can, you know, put some interpretation in the chat of these five examples. I'll just talk about one of them, which could be that as we uh, deforest uh, the land and enter into areas that contain pathogens that we are naive to, that we haven't evolved with, that we don't have any resistance to, those pathogens can get people sick. So that's just one way that people can be sickened, right, by uh, interacting with the environment. And that's through zoonosis. And sometimes that's the end of the conversation, right, in a lot of environmental health um, aspects. But there are other questions, and this is where I was thinking that COVID could be a teachable moment. It doesn't really end there. Like, what about us? You know, how are we affecting wildlife? With that same example, you know, of going in there and deforesting, you can see right away that tree is dead, <laughs> right? So we are, we, can, we are killing wildlife, we're capturing wildlife in the wildlife trade, right? We're um, reducing biodiversity through agriculture. So there's a lot of things that we're doing that don't often get incorporated into the conversation of environmental health. And then sometimes those are one-off interactions, but many times they kind of continue and feed off each other. So if you can think of any ways that these, any of these five examples uh, could uh, show something like a feedback loop where one uh, input comes into the system and that causes something to increase and then that causes something else to increase, which then goes back and causes the other thing to go up. And so this can really uh, lead us to things like tipping points, right, where there's a really major effect. So one example that I would give would be the antimicrobial resistance, right? So we are giving many of our livestock uh, just antibiotics all the time in their feed so that they don't get sick because of the crowded conditions they're in. But as many of you who might be biologists or otherwise know, that actually creates selection pressure through natural selection for any bacteria that uh, can resist that antibiotic to flourish. And so it's actually, you know, creating the selection potential to create a superbug. So this is kind of an iterative process, most likely, where you give them the antibiotic, that maybe some superbugs start evolving, then that means we have to have stronger antibiotics, which then can create even stronger superbugs. And it can just lead to the point where uh, we have, um, we can't treat disease with antibiotics anymore. If that, you know, spreads from the livestock into other organisms and people. So that's just something that um, it behooves us to be aware of and in terms of looking at the environment more holistically than just, oh, how do we get sick from uh, other organisms? Next. So that's basically how, you know, COVID-19 could be this great teachable moment, you know, where we, there are calls to investigate the origins of COVID-19, some of them may be a little murky still, we may never know exactly what happens if we didn't, don't have enough access to information. But we certainly can use this as an opportunity to say, you know, what are the other consequences of the wildlife trade? You know, taking organisms out, touching their blood and tissue, that's a very good way to transmit pathogens, right? What about deforestation, right? And so, you know, the leading hypothesis is that uh, COVID-19 just came, jump to humans from bats, you know, kind of in the region where uh, 
where near where the outbreak uh, occurred. Next. But here, you know, if you're one of the many of us who, who have just been upset or plagued by these misconceptions, uh, try to think of some misconceptions that came out of this pandemic, things that people were saying or you putting on YouTube or otherwise, you know, disseminating on websites that maybe were just completely incorrect, <laughs> but still got a lot of traction. And that also includes uh, the vaccines themselves and the vaccine safety. So this was another way, you know, beyond expanding the definition of environmental health, another way to use COVID-19 as a teachable moment is to teach students, you know, how to distinguish misinformation, disinformation from reliable information. So give them some tools to be able to critically assess, you know, where did you hear this? Was it on a YouTube video? You know, was it some image on Facebook, you know, or was it an accredited source? Next. So this is the exercise itself. It's pretty simple. So I, I don't have, you know, the hours of uh, content right now. So, you know, I love active learning tools, you know, ways to make the students active, center the classroom on them as opposed to just passively listening to somebody giving a lecture. Uh, and so I love this jigsaw idea. This exercise is really just an adaptation of jigsaw. It's not a perfect jigsaw. In a perfect jigsaw, you could give, uh, or in a more traditional jigsaw, you could give, you know, different groups, uh, have different pieces of puzzle to figure out how heart works, for example. So one group would figure out how the right atria or talk about that. The other would talk about the right ventricle. Then another would talk about the left atria and the left ventricle. And then, you know, each one wouldn't know the whole until the others had presented. So it's like putting together a jigsaw. And so this exercise is based off of that, even though, like I said, it's an adaptation. And there are parts of it that, you know, I did, you can do synchronously, asynchronously, you can adapt it in person, online. It's really very flexible. Next. So here, you know, students are encouraged to think about, you know, not just how, you know, are these, you know, are bats really, terrible and they just disease ridden organisms that make us sick you know no of course not so one way to look at that is to see well how do bats contribute to ecosystems right and they they do tremendous things you know they're they're pollinator they, they eat insects they provide us with many ecosystem services so that would be one thing that people could look at uh, as they're thinking about case studies to explore for example bats more holistically Another way they could look at it is say, you know, what have we done to bats? And, you know, unfortunately, people exploring caves or going into caves, it seems like they, uh, some people had a fungus on their boot from somewhere else. And they came into a cave, you know, here in the States, and that transmitted white nose syndrome to bats in that cave that were naive to it. And so it's decimating, you know, bat populations. So that's just another way that you can start to think about the environment more holistically and also dispel misconceptions such as well all bats should just be killed they're just these you know because there are programs where people are trying to kill bats because they were misinformed about their role in COVID-19 and it is fun to involve uh, current events because that really generates interest on the part of the student and they can also pick the various case studies so here I'm giving an example where it's kind of centered around COVID-19 next so just to wrap up, you know, once we talked about the uh, give background readings, once we kind of brainstormed what case study kind of unifying factor like bats, like COVID-19 that people want to focus on, and it could be anything, it does, you know, it could be adapted to other courses even. So there would be a synchronous online class, or it could be an in-person class now, uh, where the activities outlined, the readings are assigned and students pick their groups. Uh, and these could be recorded if they were, you know, back in the pandemic when people couldn't make it or they're in different time zones. Next. And one way that this could expand out is in, in the wildlife trade. So there was a thought uh, at one point that maybe pangolins were the intermediate organism that the virus jumped from bats to pangolins to people. And that doesn't seem to have gained a lot of traction, but it does call attention to the wildlife trade 
which is what it's thought how bats transmitted the disease to people in the first place by being captured and have their tissue and blood handled. And, you know, pangolins are the most trafficked mammal uh, and they are the only one that have these scales. And so it can really bring attention, you know, to what other negative effects we are bringing to the environment. Uh, and then what happens to the environment when it doesn't have enough pangolins in it or enough bats to complete their ecosystem role. And that talks about how these things can feed off of each other and continue to cause harm. So basically then what the students do is they pick their topic. It has a unifying theme, like in this case, it could be COVID-19. And then they uh, do their research on their own. They come to put together a 10 minute presentation using Google Slides like Aaron and I just did for this presentation or Google Docs or some other um, thing. And they have to have scholarly sources and reliable sources from the news as well. So they go through that idea of like, questioning every single source and is it reliable? Are there any misconceptions here? And if they do find some misconceptions, they should address those and explain you know, uh, how people can address misconceptions like that. So I'm almost done, uh, next. <laughs> so then the fun thing is uh, these presentations, you know, somebody who did the white nose fungus might not know about the pangolins and you know, the group that did, uh, you know, they, they can, it, it, the next part is really talking as a group after they've discussed and presented the individual case studies is like, how do these fit together into a more uh, comprehensive uh, vision of environmental health? Right, and so hopefully, uh, and students can peer review each other. The instructor uh, evaluates the assessment, the presentations using a rubric. So that also gives them room for peer review where people can say, oh, I understood this, or I didn't understand that, or this or that wasn't clear, or this was great. <laughs> okay, next slide. So I won't review it. I just put a slide in there to kind of go over it. But I just want to say that this can be adapted, obviously, to any field, environmental studies, biology, public health, uh, even other disciplines like English. <laughs> Next. So just for concluding remarks, all of us suffered uh, disruptions throughout the world uh, with this pandemic. But it also reminded us that we're living on a planet that has limits and that we, it would behoove us to better understand how ecosystems work, even if it is just to protect ourselves or if we wanna stop harming other organisms. And so we learned from this that um, we gained new skills. You know, I personally didn't know how to use all these Google tools before the pandemic. I didn't know how to use Google poll or doodle poll or the poll that, sorry, poll everywhere. <laughs> Uh, and then we could adapt all of these and it was possible to do this during the pandemic and learn new technologies and it can be work used for other fields. So in a sense, the connections, the collaborations and the innovations were a silver lining in this crisis. So thank you so much for being such a, a great audience and uh, we definitely are interested in answering questions and, and thank you so much again. So um, if you have a question for our panelists today, um, you can put them into the Q&A on the lower center of your Zoom toolbar, okay? And you can ask it anonymously, or you can ask it with your name. And we have plenty of time for questions. My first question for you all is to talk a little bit about how did you get interested in publishing your teaching scholarship? Um, and um, what has been the benefits to you in getting published in Jimby? And would you recommend it to others to take this route to um, uh, disseminate their new teaching scholarship? All right, okay. Um, <laughs> this is my first, this is actually my first time writing. So Jenny has more experience writing about pedagogy. Uh, this is the first time I've ever written uh, anything in a pedagogy journal. And I have to say like, it was really good to formalize, like I had created this exercise sort of without any sort of formal goal in mind. And it was really good to formalize the pedagogy behind it. And also when we started to organize this to write, just thinking about exactly like what the challenges are, were that we were facing. Like we, the three of us on this paper teach different classes. And so coming together and thinking about common challenges that we had, but then seeing the unique ways that the three of us approached it 
um, was a really great collaborative process. Like I spent a lot of time teaching alone at, um, and so it was really good to just see what they're doing in their classes, which we don't have a lot of time to do. Um, and so, and I got to read a lot of pedagogy literature that I actually <laughs> hadn't, hadn't spent the time reading before. Cause I, I re I'm an evolutionary biologist. So I usually think about that instead. So I'm it definitely as I'm reading about it more and I, I'm really happy that this is what we ended up doing with this work. Yeah, I agree. And um, publishing in this journal was really nice. It was seamless. You know, we, it was just very professional and fast and um, just a good experience. You know, sometimes journals just take forever to review something <laughs> or it's not very clear and it takes forever to get published. And, you know, none of that happened here. So it was a great venue. And something else that was really nice is that, um, People found it very quickly. You know, I got some emails that I hadn't even uh, disseminated it myself, and um, people, they heard about it. So that means that, you know, Jemby helped to uh, disseminate it, which I appreciate. And we also picked up some press. Uh, so we had a couple of um, articles written about it. Uh, and so it was even used in a workshop uh, at the Natural History Museum. And I think they heard about it. They didn't hear about it from us. <laughs> so uh, I, I really appreciated all of that as well. So great to hear. Um, I'm super excited as, a, as an ambassador to Jim B to hear about that. So I'm gonna pass on that good feedback to the editor. Um, I had a question about, um, you, you mentioned that you were in, instructing your students of how to find credible sources. I was wondering what kind of instruction did you give them about this information literacy skill? And did they have a difficult time implementing this skill of finding good, credible sources? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, maybe I'll go first since uh, that was in my, and then uh, Aaron, I know Aaron does a lot of really interesting uh, things along these lines. And we're actually writing another uh, paper about trust in science. And part of that paper is exactly about uh, this this particular piece. So I think that this COVID-19 was just even going through the process as, as we did that I just outlined is, you know, identifying, um, you know, some student might say, oh, I found a misconception that vaccines cause sterility or, you know, <laughs> uh, something like that. And then we could look at where that source was. We could pull that up see it and then say okay what would make you believe this source and then you often see that there wasn't really any credible uh information there you know it could have just been on a website or a tweet or um a youtube right with no and then we talk about what would make you believe this and then we go into the whole thing about you know credentials and uh trusted sources finding backup information, evaluating the, the source and seeing how trustworthy it is. Um, and then we could then find a source that really was more credible and say, okay, this source is saying that vaccines do not cause sterility, <laughs> right? And then we could do the same thing for that. Um, so that's one way that we did it. Yeah, I this this semester I used an activity called the craft test. I'll put it in the chat. Um, I don't have a link directly on me, but if you search for craft that that specific wording of craft test, you can. Um, there's a, several live um, university libraries have actually really nice like in like one page PDF of what it is, but it stands for currency relevancy authority, accuracy, and purpose. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I, we did an exercise in my class. My, so I teach non-major um, intro bio. Um, and we did, a, we did an exercise where I asked them to just go on, find a product that made a claim. So a lot of them looked at like nutrient, like um, supplements or um, some, a lot of people looked at makeup. And I said, like, it doesn't matter what, like you see what the company used as their source and you evaluate it. And it's interesting, like they, they would kept pushing back on me, like, or like, this isn't a good source. Like, I know this isn't a good source. And I was like, but do you have to go through the crap test to do it? So it's, you know, I think a lot of times we struggle to get them to 
get good sources, but when they bump into one that isn't a good source, they actually, they're like, I was like, would you trust this to use in a research paper? And in many cases we kept going back and forth. And I was like, it doesn't matter if it's bad, just use it and evaluate why it's bad. Like, can you explain to me in words why it's bad? Um, and we end up using a lot of secondary sources because I kept finding that they would search for these primary sources. And I know they were just looking at the abstract. Like I know they weren't reading the papers, um, but it's a real, like if, I could we I think we should teach a whole class on just how to find sources that you like and then they'll just ask me instead like I'll get asked the question I'm like but you could google that like I'm going to google it so like why wouldn't you google it first and then ask me like I right it's it's a struggle I'm totally with you there um when I was teaching um small level arts class um two years ago in virology, the students were seniors and they came to me with citing Wikipedia and I thought, oh no, I've got a long way to go. <laughs> so I think we all um, find this is an incredibly important skill that we need to take the time to teach, you know, maybe, maybe make it a learning outcome in your course. Um, cool. Thanks for talking about that. I have one question from um, an attendee. Can you talk a little bit about challenges that you saw when you were teaching these modules and how did you tackle these challenges? So I guess I'll go first. Um, my biggest challenge I've been, I'm still teaching a one class remotely right now. Um, and I struggle with group work a tremendous amount. Um, I've actually basically stopped doing it in my remote classes because I would go into breakout rooms and they would just be silent. Like everyone's screens would be off. Like I would have a Google doc so I could see what they were supposed to be doing. And they could see that like each they had divide, like to their credit, they'd like come into the room and been like, so you take this question, I'll take this question and I'll take this question. So they weren't discussing it at all. And it just became like, why am I like, right? Like I kept bouncing around rooms and I just like, no one was talking to each other. And they like, there clearly was feedback in my mid-semester survey that they didn't really like, they felt awkward. It felt like they got thrown into rooms. Um, and so I've had much more success in my online classes of doing polls. And the reason I use poll everywhere is because you can have them open end respond, and then you can show all the responses and then try to get them to see like, see, this is what this person's thinking. This is what this person's thinking. Um, and I've been finding at least in the online ones, it keeps them engaged, it keeps them awake, even if, so I have all these issues where they don't turn their screens on. So at least it, even in a smaller class of 25 students, it was, it's been, I had, I had students in the middle of the night, right? Like it was, a, that's been my biggest issue is getting them to work together in an online format. They do it much better. If you make them groups in person, they like, they'll do it. Cause I think you can, they can see you in the background <laughs> hovering. But on Zoom, there's just like no accountability unless I'm in that room with them. Yeah, I think there's many of those uh, similar challenges. So I, I don't have a lot to add. Uh, one thing I always am afraid of that hasn't happened yet, but I wonder, you know, if it ever will, is if someone flat out says they're anti-vax or they just think it's a conspiracy or, you know, something like that, that actually hasn't happened. And I think a lot about how I could handle that. And I also teach, you know, evolution. And sometimes I wonder, you know, I have students that might be religious and I'm telling them the world is 4.6 billion years old. <laughs> and I, I also wonder, am I going to be challenged on that? And the way that I address those or head them off, maybe a reason I haven't had that is because I always talk about evidence. So I tell them right away, all my students in the beginning, you don't have to believe me. I actually want you to question what I'm saying, what you're seeing in the readings, you know, go and fact check. I actually have a fact checking exercise in one of my classes about mass extinctions where we, we read a popular book and then I say, okay, do you believe what this guy is saying? You know, he's a journalist. He interviewed all these scientists, but what, you know, is he telling us what they actually said? And then they go in and they find that they pick a scientist, they 
look at the peer reviewed papers, which is also a way of reinforcing, you know, looking at peer reviewed papers, talking about peer review. They look into the reputation of that person. They Google, you know, anything controversy with, with that particular person to see if anything, you know, comes up as it probably would if it was a talking head on a radio show, right? Uh, and so, you know, I always encourage them to fact check me, fact check anything. I was like, you know, because I have had people, especially more in evolution class, say, it, I believe it, but I can't wrap my mind around the fact that the world is 4.6 billion years old. And, and people even go into an existential crisis, not a crisis, but questioning. And so I say, yeah, look it up. Find, you know, if you see any opposing viewpoints that say the earth is 6,000 years old or people coexisted with dinosaurs or something like, let's take a look at those and, and you know, head off that kind of challenge that way. Great. I really like the emphasis on, on the evidence because um, that is the essence of science, right? It's important for all college educated students to take with them, no matter whether they're scientists or not. So we're going to take a short break um, from our, um, okay, here, we're going to take a very short break from um, question and answer, and I have much more questions to get to, but if you could please give us some feedback um, about your experience today. Um, this event was free, brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology, and we do need participant feedback um, in order to keep running events like these. So um, please do take literally 30 seconds to do click, click, click for three multiple choice questions. All right, now, so one of our questions, I will go ahead and answer. Um, so one person asked, um, if I wanted to submit a paper in Jimby, um, would I have to include um, statistics such as number of students or maybe um, assessment of student learning? And so um, the question is, is that kind of the dreaded response is, is it depends. <laughs> so um, the, the answer, it really depends on what section you submit to. So into the chat, I'm going to put a link to the section policies for the different types of papers that you can submit to Jimby. And so the paper that we're talking about today was submitted in the perspective section in a special issue. Um, if you were to submit a short tips and tools, which is only two manuscript pages, you just submit a description of the activity you did with your students, and you don't need to include any assessment data or statistics about um, what your students learned. Uh, however, if you wanted to submit a research paper, then you would need very extensive data about your students, about how they learned and such. So um, if you're interested in more, learning more about Jim B, take a look at those section policies and um, you can get your information there. And you can always email me. I'll put my email in the chat if you wanna learn more about Jim B. Okay, so we have a few more minutes. If you have more questions for our speakers, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. So can you talk a little bit about, and, and maybe I missed this, but the, what was the level in the course that you taught the Backyard Biodiversity module in? And you, and I'm interested in this because you mentioned that you had students from all over the world. Did you find that um, this was equally impactful of activity, no matter where they lived in the world? Yeah, um, so I mostly have freshmen and sophomore students. Uh, and I also use this in an intro to um, like a survey intro to bio course for majors. So I mostly teach non-majors, but this summer I used it in a major class who are also all around the world. And you know, what's really interesting about this is that I think that, and I, so I've done it where people are all around the world and where almost everyone is in New York City. Um, so it's a really different. And so I think everyone ends up this summer, almost all my students were in New York City and almost no one got the exact same plants which is really cool. So that's actually what we spent time looking at is that, right, you'd think like in a major metropolis where like there's basically just ginkgo trees on each street that you would think that there isn't a lot of diversity in the plant life. And it really, I think that was the key takeaway the students took from it this summer was that there actually is a tremendous amount of plant life um, in New York City. Um, and the most interesting thing, which I didn't talk about is when we did it where students went, were at home during the pandemic, is that a lot of students living in suburban areas 
And in some cases, the, the urban areas had more plant diversity than the suburban ones because of how plant suburban communities are. And they instead discovered that they had a lot of the same invasive species or introduced species, no matter where they were in the world. That like, you know, you could be in Texas and you could be in New Jersey and oddly you had the same sort of um, ornamental um, introduced species in the garden. Um, so it was, it was a cool thing to see. We had like a, many people were in similar areas that were just in slightly different regions. So it was, it was a, I didn't know what to expect. And it ended up being a really diverse sample of, tr of mostly trees and plants. How about the environmental health module? Was that taught to students all around the world as well? Or did you find um, differences in the impact of the module based on um, the student population or student identity? Yeah, that varied a little bit. Um, I think that yeah, most of the students were in the United States. I did have, you know, maybe a student in China, and I also had people in, in different time zones. Um, so, but my usually do 930 classes. So that sort of 930 AM, it, it heads off some people who are gonna be, you know, <laughs> uh, in a very, very different time zone. Um, but there was some diversity uh, in terms of where people were all over the world. And, and now everybody is supposed to be back on campus. So, you know, that's a whole new experience where, you know, you really do have people from all over uh, who can take a 9.30 a.m. <laughs> class. Okay, last question um, in this one. Um, um, do I say it correct? E Eugenia? Oh, thank you, Eugenia. Everybody Eugenia. says Eugenia. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I want to be sure I get that right. Eugenia. Um, did you find some feedback from students who didn't consider the environment responsible for COVID-19? If, if so, about how many students? And how did you handle them? Or um, did you just accept it and move on? No, I didn't. It's the same way people don't, you know, flat out question uh, evolution or vaccines. And also, you know, this population at... Um, NYU, they, I guess also because I was already encouraging them to question, I don't, I still wonder if there are people who, I, I guess you might be referring to the lab leak, right? So uh, at the time uh, when I was uh, teaching this, the lab leak hypothesis had been completely squashed in the liberal media, right? And a lot of these students, even though they come from, you know, many different states, uh, I do think there is some kind of group think. <laughs> and I think that I was guilty of that as well because I completely dismissed the lab hypothesis as well. <laughs> and, and I still think that it came from bats in nature, but you know, even Aaron and I were talking about this and saying, it, it's not impossible, you know, and, and, and that publication that I showed you in science is saying it could have happened that way. And no one I know thinks that um, it was deliberate done like it could have been by accident but so I think that maybe the students I also put them in a lot of small groups and think pair share maybe in those small groups they might have questioned it but there, there might have also been some resistance to sounding like um, ignorant and you know because at the time it, I just remember that whole hypothesis was completely shut down like if you thought that it was a lab leak it kind of meant you know that you weren't a good critical thinker or something but um now i actually teach that figure differently and i say you know it it might have even been a scientist who interacted with a bat <laughs> um but yeah i don't know if that answers the question that helps um, and this is a continuously evolving situation. More we learn, um, more we know. So um, that, that concludes our question and answer for today. Into the chat, I just posted a link to the Jimby Live playlist. And so a recording of this video and all other Jimby Live webinars that we've done. 
can be found in the YouTube playlist. So you can go ahead and bookmark it and um, watch this recording, probably posted next week, or you could watch any other episodes that you've missed. So our next session will be Friday, December 3rd, same time. Uh, make sure you um, mark your calendars for that and we'll see you then. Thank you so much to our speakers. We really appreciated your work today.